Hi there. In this video, I'm going to show you how to <clears throat> Hello everybody. In this video, we're going to talk about what LiDAR point cloud data is and how you can convert point cloud format into a gridded digital elevation model that's better for display and calculation. So let's get right into it. So LiDAR is an interesting uh, data set because it's collected by firing a laser from an airplane and using a scanner that's basically going back and forth across the track. So this leads to a very irregular, or not, not random, but irregular spacing of laser shots. There may be some areas where you have a lot of shots, like over here, in some areas where you have relatively few shots, like over here. So that creates a problem for analyses, like hydrologic analyses, where we really need to have an elevation value for every point on a landscape. Moreover, LiDAR data is also complex because each laser shot actually generates multiple returns. Uh, it does, doesn't have to, but it can. So you imagine the laser pulse coming down from the aircraft here. Imagine there's vegetation on the land surface. You might get an initial return off of a tree branch and then multiple returns off other tree branches before finally getting a return off the ground. So LiDAR data, truthfully, is actually a time series of information. Um, it's a time series of energy measurements as the pulse comes back. And each of these energy pulses is then converted into a so-called return. Um, and you can have you know, any number of returns. But it's important to always know with LiDAR, you're always dealing with an interpretation of these energy pulses that have been already classified by someone else into returns. Uh, and depending on the land surface, you could have a lot of returns, or you may have a single return if you're just shooting at bare earth or pavement or something like that. So to deal with this kind of the complexity, the irregular spacing and the multiple returns of LiDAR data, uh, it's helpful to use a format called point cloud. Um, and we'll usually see this with LiDAR data with an extension .las or sometimes .laz. Um, and so point cloud is unique because typically it's a list of x and y coordinates of the shot point so your coordinates, and then multiple z values, and possibly the classification associated with each of those z or elevation values. So basically you have more than one z value for each x and y, so it's like a cloud of points. And it is possible to view that in a kind of a raw format. There's a number of point cloud viewers that let you kind of look at the shape and see all the different points at their true height and location. And here's just an example of what that data format might look like in table format. So it's a point cloud format. We've got the X, the Y, the Z. Then in this case, we've got some like RGB indices. But you could have any, any number of additional data points associated with each, each point in your point cloud. So why would we want to go about converting point cloud data into a raster grid? A couple reasons, and there's many. One is that it allows us to filter the data to include only specific laser returns. So by kind of, maybe we, for example, we only want to get out the, the ground returns, the, the returns we know are off ground and not off tree branches. This is going to reduce our file size. We're going to throw out you know, half or two thirds of the data. So we're going to have a much smaller file size that's easier to work with. It's also going to allow us to assign an elevation to each pixel in a regularly spaced raster grid. So we're going to take care of this irregular spacing problem, um, and we're going to, going to extrapolate and interpolate our, our LiDAR shots into a regularly spaced grid that's better for visualization and calculations. So let's talk first about how we filter laser returns. So the important thing to know is that laser returns are already uh, categorized or classified by the data provider. So wherever you download your LiDAR data from, um, there are, the shots are already going to be classified. And, and if you want to know exactly how that's done, it varies slightly in each case. And you need to look in the metadata or the associated readme files with your data. But 
There are um, a series of classes that are quite common. So typically, uh, class 0 would be all the points. Class 2 would be ground, ground points so, uh, that have been classified as bouncing off the ground, and so on and so forth. And so if we use, um, all, if we use only ground points, or perhaps if you're bold and, and you use only last return points, you're going to create a bare earth DEM or something close to a bare earth DEM, depending how much vegetation you have. But of course, if you use last return, you're assuming that last return is off the ground, which it, it might or might not be. Great. So let's turn now and look at uh, how do we actually convert the irregular laser shots into a regular raster elevation grid or a digital elevation model. So uh, essentially what we're going to do is first create a grid of empty pixels. That's going to be our DEM. Those are shown here by these purple squares. And we want to assign an elevation value, a single elevation value, into each of these uh, raster cells or pixels. And what we're going to do is we're going to use a search radius known as little r. And in this example, we've defined the search radius as 60 centimeters. So, and that's shown, the radius is shown here by this circle. And imagine we're trying to define a value for the point P. I acknowledge this, this in this graphic is misleading because we'd love for point P to be at the center of a pixel. But uh, just imagine point P is at the center of a pixel. Uh, so we define our search radius, and we're going to, in this case, we identify three shot points that are within um, a 60 centimeter radius. This one's 23 centimeters away, this one's 58 centimeters, 35 centimeters away, and so on. And they each have their own elevation value, 230, 320, and 580. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically now compute a weighted average of those values, and we're going to weight them based on how far they are from the center of the pixel. And anything outside the radius doesn't get included for this particular pixel. So there's lots of ways you could, you could compute this weighted average. A common approach is inverse distance weighting. Um, it's a type of weighted mean. So again, considering our three pixels that were in the search radius, what we'll do uh, for the numerator, we will multiply each elevation by 1 over its distance. So we're going to weight them by 1 over distance. So it would be 230 times 1 over uh, 23, 320 times 1 over 58, 580 times 1 over 35, and so on. Then we're going to divide them. We're going to sum those and divide them by the sum of 1 over distance. It's essentially a weighted mean uh, using a 1 over r weighting as opposed to a 1 over r squared. So if you want to penalize more for distance, you might use a 1 over r squared instead of a 1 over r. So this gives us a weighted average, and that will then be the, the elevation value for that pixel p. So one big question that comes up in this is, uh, what is the best uh, radius to use? Right? How do we pick that search radius? And it, the answer is, it depends on the density of your shot spacing. So here's a pretty cool example from Aerosmith and Zielke, 2009, where they really looked into this question. They took a DEM along the San Andreas Fault, had an average shot spacing of 3.6 shots per meter squared. All right, so each one by one meter pixel had an average of 3.6 laser shots in it. But of course, in practice, because of the irregularity, it ranged anywhere from zero shots per meter squared to up to 10. So the average isn't always a perfect predictor of what your min and max will be. And so here's what they came up with. If they used a 0.25 meter radius, they got this, about 600,000 null pixels that were empty, that didn't have a shot in them, right? They use a half meter radius, they dropped that down by about a factor of 10. In a one meter radius, they had almost no null pixels. So just to visualize that, they also produced this map of shot count. And you can see, based on the aircraft having flown in this direction, kind of northwest direction, um, areas where the flight paths overlap a little bit, you get a high density of shots. In areas where the flight paths don't overlap, like in here, you get a low density of shots. Um, and in the end, what they show is basically made this really cool plot where it shows how the number of nulls increases as you drop your search radius. And so
And so the trade-off here, right, is if you're if you use a lower search radius, you can have a higher resolution DEM, right, a smaller pixel size. Um, but if you make the search radius too small, then you start to um, get a lot of empty pixels that, that don't have a value in them. Great. And just to remind you, the end result that we're looking for here is a nice gridded DEM. Once you've completed this process, you can visualize it and, and do your calculations. Uh, thanks, everybody.